Hello, my name's Graham and I'm in the congregation at Rotherham Evangelical Church. Today we are continuing our series, Crosswords, thinking about Je what Jesus said when he was dying on the cross. In Matthew chapter 27, at verse 45, we read, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? These words of our Lord Jesus Christ, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, are holy ground. One of the early church leaders, Cyril of Alexandria, was fond of saying that when we reach the limits of our ability to understand, we should adore the mystery in silence. And today's words from the cross is the place where human reason fails and reverent wonder should replace it. We should remember that there are limits to our understanding beyond which we can't and shouldn't try to go. As the hymn says, we may not know, we cannot tell what pains he had to bear. But we can think about these words with care and with humility, and we can be led to worship the Lord for the extremes that he suffered for us. For our time together, we're going to consider a majestic person, a mysterious prayer, and a merciful purpose. But first, let me briefly pray. Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, open our eyes that we may behold wonderful things from your word for we ask it in jesus name amen so a majestic person we're accustomed to seeing crosses we wear them as jewelry christian hymn videos show the cross in a soft focus flattering sunlight that's warm and uplifting some churches display a cross either outside or inside the building and we're accustomed to thinking of the cross as just a religious symbol. It's almost impossible for us to grasp the horror of crucifixion, to remember that the cross was originally an instrument of extreme brutality. We don't understand crucifixion because we've never seen anything like it in the flesh. The situation was quite different in New Testament times. In Jesus' time, Crucifixion was not against the law, it was carried out by the law. The city was watching a man hanging on a rough wooden cross, being gruesomely tortured to death by the government. They had seen crucified men along the roadsides of the Roman Empire. They knew what it looked like and smelled like and sounded like. They watched the horrific sight of this completely naked man in agony. The blood, the sweat, the flies, the heat, the smell and sight of his bodily functions taking its place in full view of everyone. The sound of his groans, his laboured breathing over the hours. He was hanging there in public and no one cared. But the Jews and Gentiles alike, any crucified person was as low and despised as it was possible to be. Crucifixion told them that this person wasn't fit to live, not even human. This person was condemned to the death of a beast, as the Romans put it. Hanging there, this man was looked on as obscene in the original sense of that word. Disgusting, repulsive, filthy foul, abominable, loathsome. Who was this person who cried out with a loud voice? The Hebrew word means roared. Who was this man who roared, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? On his cross was a sign. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. The Bible tells us about this man, Jesus, and he's very special. He is the Lord, the Son of God, the eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, 
the Word who was with God in the beginning, through whom all things were made, the great I am, the light of the world, the bread of life, the good shepherd, the way, the truth and the life, the resurrection and the life, the true vine, wonderful counsellor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, king of kings, lord of lords, alpha and omega, Emmanuel, God with us, God incarnate. So this person is both God and man. How can this be? What does it mean that God is incarnate? Uh, here is where the mystery starts. God is far greater than we can ever imagine or think. We worship one God, and within this one being that is God, there exists three eternally co-equal, co-eternal persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And God the Son, one of these three, in something we call the Incarnation, stepped into human life by becoming a real human being without ceasing to be God. It's difficult to think of God, the infinite creator of the universe and son of the Father, becoming a helpless baby. But that baby who was born of Mary was the same person who had eternally been the eternally begotten son of God the Father. Because this person, whom we now call Jesus Christ, was both divine and human, he was able to live on two levels at the same time. He continued to live on the divine level as he had done from all eternity, sharing fellowship with the Father, maintaining the universe and doing whatever else God does. But now, at the same time, God the Son began to live personally on earth as one of us. Born as a baby, growing up in Nazareth, learning scripture as any other Jewish boy would, becoming hungry, thirsty and tired. The early church leaders put it beautifully when they spoke of God the Son doing some things as God and doing other things as man. The same person did things that were appropriate for humanity and other things that were appropriate or even possible only for God. And it's this majestic person, God the Son, who has taken on the full nature of a human being while still being God, who is being subject to ritual shaming and murder, the flaying, the mocking, the spitting, the scorn, the crown of thorns and purple robe, the humiliation and degradation that culminated in the barbarity of the cross. And this majestic person cries a mysterious prayer. In his prayer from the cross, we're enveloped in mystery. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This cry from the heart comes from the lips of the Lord, not crying out to his father as he usually prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, but to his God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Lord is expressing an extreme human emotion, an emotion that he experiences because he has a human nature and is living as a man. He is experiencing a real sense of forsakenness. This is real anguish. In the Garden of Gethsemane, just before his arrest, Jesus told his disciples, My soul is consumed with sorrow to the point of death. Luke puts it more strongly, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And his prayer was this, My father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. But things go from bad to worse. He is arrested brutalized, degraded, and nailed to the cross as his life ebbs away. His enemies are rampant and triumphant, and wickedness seems unrestricted. And the Lord's sense of forsakenness 
is deep and profound. You see, the Son had always dwelt in the eternal love and presence of God the Father. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. When he submitted to John's baptism of repentance, the heavens opened and the Spirit descended on him, followed by a heavenly voice saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. When Jesus took Peter, James and John onto a mountain and he was transfigured, a cloud covered them and God said, This is my Son, whom I love. And here, in forsakenness, we come to the mystery of mysteries. How could the Father, who had been so pleased with his Son's submission and obedience to the divine will, be other than delighted when that obedience finally reaches its pinnacle at the cross? But we hear the Lord cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When he most needs encouragement, no voice cries from heaven, this is my beloved son. No angel is sent to strengthen him. No, well done, thou good and faithful servant. He is deprived of all sense of consolation. What a profound mystery. But how was the Lord forsaken? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Who said these anguished words? The Lord is expressing this deep emotion, an emotion that he experiences because he has a human nature and is living as a man. But the person experiencing this also has his divine nature, God the Father's eternally generated Son. Because of the very nature of God, it's not possible for the Father, Son and Holy Spirit to be other than in eternal fellowship and communion of love with one another. So God the Son, even on the cross, in his nature as God, remains in his eternal fellowship and communion of love with the Father and the Holy Spirit. That relation is unbroken. It cannot be broken. But it is this, the same, same eternal God the Son, in his human nature as a man, that he is, for the first and only time in his human life, forsaken by God. He's not forsaken by the Father and the Holy Spirit as God, but somehow the eternal Son is forsaken as a man in the humanity that he took upon himself. We're not told how the Lord was forsaken. Scripture is silent. The one thing the Bible shows us is this. The Lord was given over to his enemies. When his father could have rescued him, he left the Lord to his death on the cross at the hands of these sinful people. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the Lord had prayed, My father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And the father's will was not to let the cup pass from him but that he should drink the cup of God's wrath against sin so that the plan of salvation would be accomplished. There's something else that we should understand from the Lord's cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was a cry of dereliction, but not of despair or defeat. He lays hold of God, even in the darkness of near death. In his agony, he cries, my God, my God, when all support and comfort seems to have disappeared, he clings in faith and trust to his Father. And there's further evidence that Jesus' words are words of anguish, but also of hope in God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? are the first words in Psalm 22. The first part of the psalm are the words of someone who really does feel forsaken by God. And there's a very vivid description of the sufferings of crucifixion. But from Psalm 22, the voice is a hymn of thanksgiving to God. 
I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly I will praise you, for he has not despised or scorned the sufferings of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him. The Lord is invoking the whole psalm as the prayer of one who cried out to the Father in faith and trust. And we know that Jesus is using the whole psalm by just quoting one verse of it, because that was his practice in his ministry. In Matthew chapter 21, Jesus is driving the money changers out of the temple and young children were praising him. The religious leaders were indignant and they asked him, do you hear what these children are saying? Jesus' reply seems innocuous. Have you never read from the mouths of children and infants you have ordained praise? But it was far from innocuous. Jesus knew that these religious leaders would be familiar with the rest of Psalm 8. From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise on account of your adversaries to silence the enemy and the avenger. These religious leaders got the message. They were being called the adversaries and enemies of God. In other words, as he prays, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Lord Jesus Christ is praying the whole psalm. The Lord's cry of abandonment is a cry of dereliction and anguish, but not of despair and defeat, but of hope in God. The Lord is affirming his trust in God in the midst of his extreme adversity. We've thought about this majestic person. We've considered his mysterious prayer of forsakenness. And now, finally, we look at his merciful purpose. And we ask, why did the Father leave the Lord to die in agony in this most barbaric way? Well, he was forsaken, so that the plan of salvation of God's people, agreed by the Father, Son and Holy Spirit in eternity past, would be accomplished. When the Lord was on the cross, all our sins without exception were transferred to him. He was without sin, having lived a perfectly God-pleasing life in thought and word and deed. As he hung there, all our sins were placed on him. He became the final and complete sacrifice for our sins. A theologian called William Ames looked back to the Old Testament, to the priesthood and sacrificial system for sin which God gave to his Hebrew people. And he explains that what's happening on the cross is this. The Lord Jesus himself was both the priest and the sacrifice. In his divine nature, God the Son was the priest. And as priest, he was offering to the Father the sacrifice of himself in his humanity, his human body, his human blood, his human nature. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? is the cry expressing the agony of unmitigated sin. All the sins of God's people, past, present and future, and the hell that we deserve for eternity, are laid upon the Lord, and the undiluted wrath of God is poured out on the sin that he bore. The real purpose of the son's feeling of forsakenness, God's merciful purpose in his forsakenness, is punitive. It's God's just punishment for the sin of his people. As the Apostle Paul said, God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God is a God of perfect holiness. So holy is God that human beings can't look at him and live. So holy is God that even the angels veil their faces before him. So holy is God that when Isaiah had a vision of his glory, he exclaimed, Woe is me, for I am undone, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So holy is God that the Bible tells us 
he's pu too pure to look on evil. He cannot tolerate wrongdoing. And it was because the Lord was made sin for us that he cries, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, says Paul. Among all the mysteries of salvation, those small words on our behalf are high on the list. Christ was acting on our behalf as our representative and for our benefit. With the Lord Jesus as our substitute, God's wrath is satisfied. He knew forsakenness that we might be saved from it. He endured forsakenness for us, not with us. He knew forsakenness so that we may know no condemnation. It's in these words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That the limits of what we can understand are reached. It is mystery. We don't really understand. But as that wonderfully named Cyril of Alexandria said, when we reach the limits of our ability to understand, we should adore the mystery in silence. And these words from the cross are where human reason fails and reverent wonder should begin. This moment on the cross is one of the most unfathomable moments in history. Part of that great mystery is that God the Son has voluntarily chosen to assume a human nature so that in his human nature he might suffer and die. The wrath that fell on him should have fallen on us. The forsakenness from God should have been ours. Actually, it was ours because we were already alienated from God. This is not just a great example of God's love. This is the reality of God's love itself. The Father was willing to forsake the incarnate Son as a man to be gloriously present with us. The Father forsook him in order to draw near to us in love. It's at this moment that God's love towards us is shown in all its glory. This is the central moment in human history. And the proclamation of what happened in this moment is the central message of the Christian faith. It's a message that you may have heard many times in the simple statement, Christ died for you. But have you really heard it? Have you heard this message in all its terrible, majestic, glorious truth? If not, then now is the time to hear it once more. And in hearing again of God's infinite love, to gaze into the mysterious depths of God's infinite love for you. And to turn to him in repentance and faith.